Nearly two years ago, I had an opportunity to attend a week-long course for directors at the Drama League of Ireland Summer School. The particular course was examining how a director would approach various plays, one of which was Brian Friel's Translations. During my reading of this play on the course, I made a number of very interesting discoveries, which I will come to soon. First, I want to speak a little bit about Brian Friel. He was born in 1929 in County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. He trained in the priesthood in Maynooth College and became a teacher. His writing career began in the 1950s with the publication of short stories in the New Yorker magazine. <coughs> Towards the end of that decade, he began writing plays. <coughs> Excuse me. A highly accomplished dramatist, he published 24 plays in his lifetime, as well as adaptations of plays of Ibsen, Chekhov and Turgenev. One of his most famous plays, Philadelphia, Here I Come, is about a young man emigrating to America and his relationship with his father. Another renowned Friel play is Dancing at Lunasa, revolving around the lives of five sisters. His play Faith Healer, a series of four monologues, is considered a masterpiece. And Translations, first produced in 1980, is among the finest in his oeuvre. Translations deals with the clash of language and culture. The story revolves around an ordnance survey being carried out in Ireland in the 19th century by British soldiers, where they went about the country mapping the territory and renaming Irish place names. The themes of the play centre around loss of language, loss of identity and culture, misinterpretation and the insider-outsider dichotomy. Although the play is written in English, the audience understands through theatrical device that the Irish characters are speaking in Irish and the English characters in English. One character acts as a translator between them. Brian Friel died in 2015 and to commemorate him, the Irish Times published a special supplement with contributions from people lucky enough to have known him in the field of the arts. It is worth reading these as it gives some flavour of the man himself, as well as the esteem in which he was held. He was a shy man who did not court publicity and eschewed interviews. It was all about the work. Friel's papers are filed in the National Library in Dublin, and I would like to take a look at them when circumstances permit. I am not aware of any statements he made with regard to Shakespeare authorship, and so the evidence I am bringing you today derives solely from my reading of his play. Before I specify the indications in translations that Shakespeare authorship weighed on Friel's mind, I want to say two noteworthy things about Friel and one thing about myself, which have a bearing on how you might construe those matters. Firstly, with regard to Friel himself, this was not a man who had a passing interest in our knowledge of Shakespeare. In his article, The Politics of Translation, in Brian Friel's Translations and Shakespeare's Henry Plays, Irish scholar Anthony Roach notes that Friel took inspiration from King Lear when he wrote one of his first pieces of drama, the 1958 radio play This Hard House. Roach's article goes on to detail clear parallels between translations and two of Shakespeare's Henry Plays. Another of Friel's plays, Volunteers, contains a number of implicit and explicit references to Hamlet. The second point I want to make with regard to Friel is that I consider it noteworthy that in 1963, shortly after his career as a playwright had begun, Friel spent six months in the company of acclaimed director Tyrone Guthrie in Minneapolis, observing the latter directing Chekhov's play Three Sisters and Shakespeare's Hamlet. 
Friel found the experience profoundly seminal to his career. Tyrone Guthrie himself was a Shakespeare authorship sceptic. In 1962, publishing a piece to that effect in the New York Times magazine. Did the subject of Shakespeare authorship come up between them, I wonder? The point I would like to make with regard to myself is about where my own mind was at when I undertook this course. My head was full of Oxfordianism. I had recently submitted my entry to the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship Who Wrote Shakespeare video competition and was also in the process of writing up my experiences from a number of short trips undertaken over the previous few years to places associated with Edward de Vere, with a view to communicating these in the form of a one-woman show. However, the last thing I expected when sitting down at the course to read through a play set in a hedge school in a fictitious little town of Balia Bjog in County Donegal in the year 1833, not long before the Great Famine, was to be thinking again about Shakespeare authorship. But that's exactly what happened. In preparation for today's presentation and an article I am writing for the newsletter, I asked myself, am I seeing things in this play that are not there? In the course of reviewing the matters that popped out to me at the time, I discovered yet further clues and concluded that a strong prima facie case could be made that Friel not only thought deeply about Shakespeare authorship, but may even have plumbed for De Vere as author. The opening scene in Translations takes place in a disused barn, which has been repurposed as a hedge school. There are three characters present. Manus, the schoolmaster's older son, who works as his unpaid assistant. Sarah, a pupil who has great difficulty in speaking. And Jimmy Jack Cassie. The first thing that struck me was the outline of the latter in the scene description. Jimmy Jack Cassie, known as the infant prodigy, sits by himself, contentedly reading Homer in Greek and smiling to himself. He is a bachelor in his sixties, lives alone and comes to these evening classes, partly for the company and partly for the intellectual stimulation. He is fluent in Latin and Greek, but is in no way pedantic. To him, it is perfectly normal to speak these tongues. He never washes. His clothes are filthy and he lives in them summer and winter, day and night. He now reads in a quiet voice and smiles in profound satisfaction. For Jimmy, the world of the gods and the ancient myths is as real and as immediate as everyday life in the townland of Balia Bjog. A thought flashed through my head. There are aspects of that description that evoke Edward de Vere. In the opening lines, Manus encourages Sarah to try and say her name. Come on, Sarah, this is our secret. Nobody's listening. Nobody hears you. Jimmy, in the background, interjects with his opening line in Greek. Ton demebet epita thea glaucopus athene. The appendix at the back which I understand came with the original play script, translates this as, but the grey-eyed goddess Athene then replied to him, and indicates that it is from chapter 13 of the Odyssey. Eventually, Sarah manages to say a complete sentence. My name is Sarah. Manus is delighted and says, Soon you'll be telling me all the secrets that have been in that head of yours all these years. Jimmy continues a pace reading from the Odyssey. He quotes another excerpt from chapter 13, this time presented in the play in English, wherein Athena disguises Ulysses in order that no one will recognise him. She dimmed his two eyes that were so beautiful and clothed him in a vile, ragged cloak begrimed with filthy smoke. 
and about him she cast the great skin of a filthy hind. Jimmy then asks the others, You know what they call her? To which Manus replies, Glaucopus Athene. That's it, says Jimmy, the flashing-eyed Athene. At the mention of flashing-eyed, something within me stirred. As I recalled Gabriel Harvey's Latin address to Edward de Vere in 1578, with the famous line which can be approximated in English as Thine eyes flash fire, thy countenance shakes a spear. I thought, is there something going on here? We have the act of declaring a name being linked to the creation of a secret and to the spilling of secrets. At the same time as this is occurring, a so-called prodigy who can speak Latin and Greek references the spear-shaking goddess Athena. And then, from the whole of the Odyssey, alights on a passage that references Athena in the act of disguising Ulysses. And now, on top of that, a reference to flashing-eyed. As the scene continues, it becomes apparent that Jimmy is obsessed with the goddess Athene. He compares Gráinne from the legendary Irish tale of Dermot and Gráinne unfavourably with her. He then asks the other two, If you had the choosing between Athene and Artemis and Helen of Troy, all three of them Zeus's girls, which would you pick? Without waiting for a response, he says, I think I've no choice but to go bull straight for Athene. By God, sir, them flashing eyes would fair keep a man jigged up constant. To which Manus responds, You're a dangerous bloody man, Jimmy Jack. And Jimmy says, Flashing eyed. Ha! Sure Homer knows it all, boy. Homer knows it all. I found the idea of Jimmy being bestowed sexual prowess by a non-real entity, the deity Athena. And Manus's response that this makes Jimmy dangerous, peculiar. I asked myself, well, without Athena to prop him up, so to speak, what is Jimmy? Is he not dangerous or even emasculated? Some new characters entered the scene and talk turns to the activities of the English soldiers carrying out surveying in the locality for the purposes of mapping the territory. Pupils Bridget and Dolty tell the group that the Redcoats are lugging about a big machine called Theodolite. Jimmy says, Theodolite, what's the etymology of that word, Manus? To which Manus responds, no idea. Jimmy says, Theo, Theos, something to do with a god, maybe Thea, a goddess. Feeling that Freel might be prompting us, the readers stroke listeners, to investigate the origins of Theodolite, I did a bit of research that evening and discovered that this machine was first associated with a 16th century mathematician named Leonard Diggs, who happens to be the grandfather of the Leonard Diggs who wrote a prefatory verse in the 1623 folio of Shakespeare plays and again in the 1640 edition of Shakespeare poetry. There are many further references to matters which I believe are related to Shakespeare authorship. But to keep time, I'm going to turn now to a passage in the play that I believe relates directly to Edward de Vere. To give some context for this piece, the English soldiers who are tasked with mapping the territory are also tasked with taking all the Irish place names in the locality and anglicising them, either by direct translation or by deriving an approximate word. Now, because the soldiers don't speak Irish, the schoolmaster's older son, Owen, is helping them with this activity. Ironically, the English soldier, soldier Yoland, who is working with Owen to translate the place names, 
has much more sympathy for retaining the culture than does Owen, an Irishman. This activity of renaming place names ties into one of the main themes of the play, which is that not only does translation result in the loss of language, but also the loss of cultural and historical identity. As many of the Irish place names have stories attached to them, which are lost in translation. Before I turn to the passage in question, I would ask that you permit me to give you a minute long tutorial on how to form the genitive case in the Irish language. This will greatly assist your appreciation as to what I think Freel is doing. Now, the Irish for the word house is Teach. And the Irish for the name Brian is Brian. So it's spelled the same, but it's just pronounced differently. Now, if we want to say Brian's house, we put the object Teach first and the person doing the possessing second. But certain changes are made to the spelling and pronunciation of Brian. So Brian's house becomes Teach Vrian. So a H has been added in and also an additional I. The additional I does not change the pronunciation, but the H changes the pronunciation from Brian to Vrian. In the play, there is a discussion around how to translate the place name Tober Vri. Leading up to this discussion is a conversation between Owen, who, as I mentioned, is the schoolmaster's son, and Yoland, who is the English soldier with a touching affinity for the area. Yoland feels that something is being lost in the undertaking of the translation from Irish to English. Something is being eroded, he says. Owen, rather exasperatingly, stabs his finger at the map and says, we've come to this crossroads. Come here and look at it, man. Look at it. And we call that crossroads Tubber Re. And why do we call it Tubber Re? I'll tell you why. Tubber means a well. But what does Re mean? It's a corruption of Brian, Brian, an erosion of Tubber Vrian. Because 150 years ago, there used to be a well there, not at the crossroads, mind you, that would be too simple, but in a field close to the crossroads. And an old man called Brian, whose face was disfigured by an enormous growth, got it into his head that the water in that well was blessed. And every day for seven months, he went there and bathed his face in it. But the growth didn't go away. And one morning, Brian was found drowned in that well. And ever since, that crossroads is known as Tubber Re, even though that well has long since dried up. Now, if you swap around the middle two letters of Re, you get fear. Tubber Re is by far the most cited place name in the play. There were three things I found fascinating about this passage. First, it is bookended by references to erosion. Immediately before the subject of Tubber is raised, Yoland says something is being eroded. At the end of the description of Tubber Owen says, what do we do with a name like that? Do we scrap Tubber altogether and call it what? The cross? crossroads? Or do we keep piety with a man long dead, long forgotten, his name eroded beyond recognition, whose trivial little story nobody in the parish remembers? The second thing that floored me, and to my embarrassment I didn't see this straight away, it actually came to me in the middle of the night as I was thinking about this passage. Tober Vree is supposed to be an Irish place name that Owen and Yoland are attempting to find a suitable 
translation for. But there is no letter V in the Irish language. The V sound exists, but it is made with the letters B, H. Moreover, the double E combination does not exist in the Irish language. That pronunciation does exist, but it is made with the I, Sheena Fada. And sometimes the Sheena Fada is omit omitted, as in the name Brian. So an Irish playwright in a play that has Irish place names at its centre, inserts into a place name that has the most discussion in the play, a letter and a vowel combination that does not exist in the Irish language. That can only be deliberate. I went through every other place name mentioned in the play and counted at least 24, and they all appeared to me to be spelled correctly. The only one spelled incorrectly that I can see is Tubber Vri. Now, the Tubber is also spelled incorrectly. There is a Nye inserted, which should not be there. And the addition of this I puts it into the genitive case. So it's not only Brian's well, the well is possessing Brian. And I will go into that a little bit more in the, um, the newsletter. Uh, I want to mention as well that the name, the origins of the name Brian are thought to be associated with high or noble after Brian Brew, the High King of Ireland. The third thing that really struck me about the passage was something said in the conversation after the explication of the meaning of Tubber Vri. Yoland declares that the place name should remain Tubber Vri. Owen is exasperated with Yoland and declares, even though the well is a hundred yards from the actual crossroads and there's no well anyway, and what the hell does Vri mean? Owen is saying, what the hell does free mean? But in the previous passage, he asked, what does free mean? As a rhetorical question and proceeded immediately to answer it. So it makes no sense that he is now asking, what the hell does free mean? The only explanation I have is that the playwright is asking us to consider what free means. I showed this passage and the dialogue leading up to it to my good friend, Oxfordian Dorna Bewley. And Dorna came up with three further fascinating points. And again, I'm going to elaborate on these in the newsletter. So before I say goodbye, I would like to leave you with a quote from the man himself. At the McGill Summer School in 2008, which was honouring his work, and at which Freel himself was present, Irish Times journalist Rosita Boland diligently persisted in trying to get an interview with him. At the end of the week, to her astonishment, she was informed that Freel would meet her in the lobby in five minutes and would answer three questions. She was thrilled and scrambled together her questions. The third of which was, why does he not give interviews? Freel's response, reminded me of another playwright who went some 400 years before him. The whole act of writing is intensely private and it can't be accompanied by self-promotion. I think interviews contaminate the necessary privacy a writer needs. That sounds almost priggish, but for me it's the truth.